So I get the pleasure to uh, introduce our, uh, our speaker, Steve Livingston. As you can see, he has his uh, affiliation up here as a, as a professor of both media and public affairs and international affairs at uh, George Washington University. I imagine you often get introduced as an expert on affairs. <laughs> no. <laughs> Well, uh, many of you know his work. He's done extensive work on uh, ICT and collective action, particularly in developing countries, and uh, even special emphasis on Africa. We heard some stories of last time about sneaking into Sudan without a visa and the variety of things like that. He's uh, a fellow of Social Sciences Research Institute, a and a Fulbright Scholar. And uh, we are just delighted to have you here. And Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to have this opportunity to share some of these ideas um, with you today. I want to really, at the very top, thank um, Peter and Manuel and Nosh for giving me this opportunity to talk with you today and to learn from you. I have to say that uh, as an international affairs scholar, as I think of myself principally, I suspect that I'm coming to you certainly with a slightly different vocabulary, a slightly different set of, of issues. Uh, and, and as a matter of fact, that's what I want to talk to you about. Uh, my talk today will either be new and interesting and cutting edge for you, or out there and irrelevant to your interests. So we'll, we'll see which way it falls. Um, but that's just the way it is. Let me uh, begin by just offering a bit of an, inter uh, an overview of, of what I want to uh, describe to you today. Uh, beginning with really treating statehood, uh, the state itself, as variable, not as fixed. Uh, entity, not, a, not an assumption, not a research assumption, but rather zeroing in on the possibility that statehood itself is, an, is, a, is a key variable in thinking about the role of information technology and networks. Then I'll go on to more familiar territory with all of you and think about and just overview, give an overview of the idea that information and collaboration costs are also variable. Uh, and then suggest that in actuality, a lot of what you're paying attention to and focusing on in your fascinating research is really a subset of a larger set of concerns about the role of information and communication technology in collective action, some of which includes protests, some of which includes contention, but there are other ways, other kinds of public goods that come to play an important part in what could be a, a very interesting research agenda. And then, uh, dipping in a little bit more uh, specifically, I'm going to turn to Errol and Kim Port's book that I was introduced to by Bruce Bimber a while ago, to, to really use that as a, as, a, as a point of entry into a discussion about the things that interest me. So with that as the overview, let me really uh, begin here by making the point that often, as we go all the way back to Charles Tilley and Sidney Tarot and others, the state is understood as a necessary condition for, for emerging social movement activations. Taro and others have many, many quotes that, that emphasize the centrality of the assumption of the existence of a consolidated state uh, as a starting point for the, under, for the emergence of social movements. Uh, in a cheeky moment that I've backed off from, I, I, I've had a couple of subsequent slides that, that I'll only explain. In terms of experiencing a consolidated state institution, the guy in the bunny suit is about to experience a consolidated state active uh, movement here with a guy that's like this. It's uh, not pretty. Uh, what I want to do instead is, is really focus on what we understand and to encourage you to think about the quality of statehood itself. What does it mean to talk about a consolidated state? So one of the standard ways that we can think about this is to talk about a, uh, a legitimate monopoly on the use of force and the ability to uh, enforce authoritative political decisions, etc., uh, which is all well and good, until you pause for a moment and you consider the fact, or at least I, my IR, International Relations uh, fellow scholars treated as the fact, that in actuality a consolidated state, as we understand it, is both a historical and present day anomaly around the world. As a matter of fact, my colleagues at the Freie Universität in Berlin go so far as to suggest that two-thirds of the world's population at this point in time actually live in areas of limited statehood to varying degrees. If you begin with that, you see the enormous research opportunities that are involved if a few additional assumptions can be brought to bear. So I use the term following the IR scholarship, uh, areas of limited statehood, to describe geographical spaces 
or policy fields or social groups for which states either fail to maintain a monopoly on force or where they experience significant problems regarding rule making, uh, implementation and enforcement. What, what do we have to say, those of us who are interested in information and communication technology, what can we say about those areas? What kind of, of uh, effects take place there? For those of you who are probably familiar, there are various places, data uh, sources, where you can uh, get a sense of various degrees of statehood, the degree to which the state is capable of governance. The literature speaks of governance modalities. The state is just but one of them. So these are some of the data sources that you could turn to. The one that I often turn to most readily is the Mohammed Ibrahim Index for African Governance. It's, it's a it's, it's an index that's created in Africa by Africans. I think it's most appropriate. But if you begin, my point here is if you begin to think about statehood itself, not as something that is invariable, but rather variable, you can think of it as a continuous variable. With weak states, perhaps anchored on one end by obvious examples, Somalia, the DR Congo, and then of course everyone's favorite on the other end, Sweden, or, or some such place as that, where the state is actually quite consolidating its capability of governance. Uh, most of the photos, Amanda asked, she wanted to see the photos. Most of these photos that I share with you, I've taken in various places. So my research takes me to uh, places like Mathara. And this photo actually underscores one of the aspects of limited statehood that I wanted to emphasize. This is in the heart of Kenya. This is the heart of Nairobi. So this is, in a sense, an area that's right at the heart of the state, but yet it's an area of limited statehood. Police don't go there. There is no sewer. There's no water. There's, there is some lighting that's brought in by an NGO. There is nothing. There, there, it, is, it is an area where there is no state presence, except for occasional police coming in to collect bribes, which, of course, isn't conducive to legitimacy. Uh, the, the sanitation is horrendous. I, I picked up, what did I get? Dysentery. I got dysentery the last time I was there. So, you know, it's a, it's a tough research environment. Uh, about a week and a half ago, two weeks ago, I guess two weeks ago, I was in, in the Edo state, in the, in the Niger Delta region of Nigeria, where the oil extraction takes place. One of the richest parts of the planet in terms of natural resources. The photo you're looking at is the data center for a police office in, in a town in, in the Niger Delta. That is the, the nature of police record keeping. This may look like just a matter of bad housekeeping that I'm sharing with you, but in actuality, it's something more than that. I took this picture, and I, I try to be sensitive to when I take pictures of prisoners. I've been going to a lot of Nigerian prisons lately, uh, and there is a face of a young man that is somewhat obscured because I don't like making people the object of my presentations. But the, the key here is, is that the faulty record keeping, the inability to, the, the state's weakness and its inability to maintain control over information leads to about two-thirds of the prison population of Nigeria being lost. They don't know how long they've been there. They don't know why they're there. They don't know when they're supposed to be uh, released. So there are the this hundreds and thousands of people who are languishing in prison, and they're not quite sure when they're supposed to be released. So one of the projects, just to jump ahead, that I'm working on is the, a digitization project where, where each prisoner extra, separate from the state, will be assigned a, 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 an identification tag and a way of tracking his or her in, um, uh, imprisonment. Let me begin to tie some things together here. If you add to the idea that states have um, are, are variable in their capability of governance, with a clearly identified already by all of your research and the other research that's, that so demarcates this field, that information and collaboration costs are also variable, you can put together, in a sense, an interesting way of thinking about a number of things. First of all, you could, um, you could plot uh, where various nation states rest along these two dimensions. You could, you could think about states that, that rest here in the lower right-hand quadrant, which demarcates consolidated states. In a, um, in a high information environment, right? This is, I, I would suggest, where a lot of your, as a matter of fact, I will suggest it in a second. Uh, we move into a new information environment, and then this is where I, my research rests, where I will argue that it's, it's uh, an emerging condition of high information, uh, low collaboration costs, but weak states. And this is, this is, a, is a sort of a, a no-go zone. Let me actually explore this a little bit further. 
And before I, I go any uh, further, let me just pause for a second. A lot of this, what I'm presenting to you today is brand new, so I really do want to get your feedback. It's actually in response to something that Bruce Bimber, a question he posed to me a few weeks ago in San Diego at the International Studies Association meeting. And the question was, are we really looking at the same things, all of us? And so what I'm trying to do is really map out, in some sense, what is all of our research focus, and are we really looking at similar ideas, similar concepts? How can we distinguish between what I'm doing as a researcher and what some of you are doing? Um, this is taking exactly the same sort of, of uh, two by two table and really trying to map some of the, the field. So here we're going back to the, the standard social movements literature that talked about the high information costs, and so therefore one of the first uh, things that a social movement needed to do is secure the resources in order to sustain itself. Uh, we then um, move up here where there are consolidated states and the information is abundant, Collabor collaboration costs have collapsed. And so here we have an examination of new organizational ontologies and morphologies, I think perhaps nicely represented by the talk that was just given by, uh, uh, by Manuel. Um, and uh, then when we move over here, we are looking at a really a sort of unique situation. It's where the state is weak and yet there is an a degree of information abundance. Uh, this violates some of the norms of the social movements literature. I understand that. But let's explore that for a second. Weak states and information scarcity, again, is, is out of my area, but there is some really interesting research that's going on right now. A very interesting and important book is Why Nations Fail that examines some of the reasons why basic kinds of institutional dynamics simply don't take place. So in any case, let me, uh, for the sake of time, you can see how that maps out even further. A lot of what I'm interested in is actually being pursued by experts in development, um, in international relations, human security, et cetera. So Tim Unwin, for instance, is a development expert. And then when we uh, get into areas of limited statehood, you, you see some other, other people who are involved in this. So what I'm trying to do is actually move the, the conversation for, from where I see so much of the contemporary research taking place in an area that's demarcated by low collaboration costs, uh, uh, information saturation, with consolidated states, and pushing it across into an area where states simply are weak, ineffectual, they aren't operating. Um, so to accomplish this, what I need to do, first of all, is demonstrate that one of the assumptions here, and that is, is that we are now in a circumstance where states are weak, but information technology creates information abundance and lower collaboration costs. And one of the standards, standard ways that you see to do that, of course, is to look at some gross indicators of late to see the exponential growth in some instances of some kinds of information technology. You can see here that, that leading the way from 2001 to 2011 on a global scale would be mobile telephony. One of the distinctions between the kind of technology that most often is the focus of social movement organization research in the global north is, is the focus on, on the internet, and on internet technology, on broadband technology, whereas when one moves to the global south, the focus is, is more clearly on handheld devices, most recently in 3G telephony. Uh, we've moved just in the last two years from, from very simple introductory uh, mobile telephony into at least 3G telephony which opens up the possibility of Facebook. It's really fascinating to go around the Niger Delta and see everyone, you ask, Are, do you have a Facebook account? And they say, yes, I have a Facebook account. Do you have electricity? No, I don't have electricity. <laughs> but they have a Facebook account. You know, so the, the impact of mobile telephony is really quite remarkable uh, in places that you, you might not necessarily expect. But you can see also some other indicators. Internet users is not anywhere near the same sort of trend line that you see with mobile telephony. And then we won't even talk about uh, fixed line phones and, and the rest. Again, I, I know I'm talking to an audience in this instance that's really quite aware of these trends, but it's perhaps helpful just to reacquaint ourselves. This is from July of 2010, where the BBC tells us that there are now over 5 billion, uh, they say connections, I think they mean subscribers, uh, around the world. 
a, a point of clarification, some of these data are difficult to interpret. You have to be careful about it because if you go into some places in the world, you'll see that a, a single individual will have three cell phones arrayed in front of them. And, and so each one of those cell phones counts towards that total. And in other instances, you'll go into a village, as I will talk about in just a second, where there's one cell phone. There's one mobile phone for that village. So that it's a subscriber. It's not a one-to-one -one correlation between people and, and phones. Looking more specifically at, um, at, in this instance, African cell phone penetration, you can see just this remarkable trend line. And of course, this is year to, well, this is not year to date. The data, uh, this chart is drawn from 2011, but the projections are really quite clear that this expansion of mobile telephony in places like Africa, Latin America, India, elsewhere is, to, is going to continue. Uh, another thing, though, to keep in mind is the expansion of broadband telephony in Africa and elsewhere. Each This map represents some of the subsea cable systems, fiber optic cable systems that are going in place around Africa in this instance. One of the more remarkable things that I've seen in recent years was last year in Uganda, seeing for miles hundreds and hundreds of men with picks and shovels digging the trench that will lot, lay the fiber, that will hold the fiber optic cable coming in from Mombasa on the Kenya coast into Kampala and elsewhere in Uganda. Uh, other NGO, and then NGOs are picking up on that and putting in broadband uh, computer systems and health clinics and schools around rural areas in Africa. We are already beginning to see some of the effects of broadband uh, um, capabilities in places like Africa. This is just a three month, October to December 2011, uh, each bubble representing a certain number of tweets. And of course, South Africa, as it always does, is the exception. South Africa is, has the largest number in just three months. But you can see also, though, at the same time, Lucky a little Rwanda, if I remember correctly, somewhere up here, I can't see my own slide very well, has 94,000 or so tweets in that period of time. So you're seeing an expanding number of, of uses for social media and places that, that's new. And again, uh, as I said a moment ago, you can also see this in Facebook accounts and elsewhere in some really remarkable places. One of the things that I would hope that those of you who, are, who do this sort of research would, would recognize is, is that there are also very interesting um, social movement expressions going on in Africa. I've been spending a, a lot of time in Nigeria and you can see that there was an Occupy Nigeria as well. And it was not precipitated, I don't mean this to be derogatory, it wasn't pre precipitated by, by cottage cheese, it was precipitated by the fact that, these, that the, the surcharge, the, the way in which the government has been supplying fuel for the generators that everyone relies on for electricity because there is no power grid that is functional and operating in any place in Nigeria, which is a deeply ironic situation given the fact that Nigeria is one of the great oil producing countries in the world, but it doesn't have a functioning, sustained power generation capabilities. So the moment when the fuel oil surcharges were removed by Good Luck Jonathan, that's when Occupy Wall Street, or Occupy Nigeria emerged and it even had its own version of, of Anonymous Nigeria. So I would hope that as our research continues to, to, to push into new territories, that we can begin to look at these dynamics and how they are very different, I suspect, in the global south revel, relative to what you find in the United States, Europe, Israel, and places of that sort. And you can see, this is a photo taken of one of the demonstrations in Lagos uh, that were uh, a part of the Occupy Nigeria movement. Okay, so my point here is, is that if there is a reason to think that there is a right new interesting research domain found in that upper left quadrant where there are weak states but an emergence of a rich information environment that leads to the possibility of low collaboration costs we need to push the envelope even further. We need to get out of the cities like Lagos or, or Nairobi or elsewhere. So to do that, what I have done, I've spent a lot of time, this, I took this photo in the Rift Valley. It took about six hours to get in by, by Land Rover, motorcycle, and walking. This is far off the beaten path. And one of the things you can see, even though it's an extremely traditional village, next to his panga, he has his cell phone. So the reach of cell phones, of mobile phones into places so far from any sort of state institution really is one of the remarkable things that you're beginning to see all over the world. 
You're also beginning to see this in other ways, other than people having cell phones in their hands. If you go into any village or town, uh, such as this is in the Democratic Republic of Congo, I took this about two years ago, I guess, you'll find that much of the village is now painted in the competing colors of various mobile uh, <laughs> providers. Uh, you see this also in Latin America, to a, not quite to the same extent, but this is the sort of thing where branding wars are going on quite constantly all across the landscape of various villages. In Afghanistan, I don't have any, any brightly colored buildings uh, pictures taken of Afghanistan, but again, in this instance, this guy uh, uh, has, as all the Afghans that I tended to see, have also their mobile phones with them, constantly talking on it. A few years ago, Kimberly and I were in um, northern India, and we were in a very remote area in the foothills of Himalayas. No electricity. This room is being illuminated by a generator. But yet I asked everyone, will you show everyone who has a cell phone, raise your hand. And you can see the vast majority of the people uh, raise their hand. These are, these are tea pickers, very poor, uh, living in very difficult conditions, but yet they were sure to have their mobile telephony. So the point is, is that we're beginning to see the spread of an information-rich environment in places where the state isn't quite uh, fully developed, hasn't consol isn't consolidated. So if we think about this, Manuel has pointed the way in considering the rise of network society, changing organizational morphology. Bruce has talked about the nature of post-bureaucratic politics and uh, in, that are found in thick and robust information ecologies. Shirky has talked about organizing without organizations. And Earl and Kimport more recently has been talking about leveraged affordances. What, um, what I am interested in doing at this point is just really using this last bit of terminology to think about the consequences of an information-rich and robust environment where the state is missing altogether, or almost missing altogether. I'll come back and talk about that in just, just a moment. I see I'm at about 26 minutes, so I'll, I'll try to wrap it up quickly. Uh, just some, some language so you can, I can share with you some of the things that I'm thinking about as I try to understand the role of this, of this new development. Uh, if you're familiar with Earl and Kim Port's terminology, they try to understand the effects of affordances, the type of actions uh, that are um, of a characteristic of actions that technology enables through its design. In other words, what can we achieve with the availability of some given set of, of conditions, technological conditions? They talk about two types. One is supersizing, and then they call the other theory 2.0. Supersizing involves those instances of where existing organizations can do what they do more rapidly, with greater speed. They can leverage the efficiencies created by a reduction of information costs, coalition building, uh, mobilizations, coordinations are all made more efficient and faster. But the fundamental nature of the collective action itself is unchanged. It requires co-presence. It requires the movement of atoms. Examples would be boycotts, protests, rallies, this sort of thing. The, the key here is, is that the efficiencies that are created only lead to an efficient movement of atoms, of people in this instance, to some place. Theory 2.0 in their terminology is different. This is when all of the action takes place solely online. It's, it's a kind of collective action that exists only in digits. Right? In those instances, and if you're old enough, you'll know who Max Hedrum is. He sort of existed solely online, right? So it's sort of like a Max Hedrum sort of collective action. But you have to be of a certain age in America probably to get that joke. That's okay, though. Um, but it exists only online. This is where information technology has its greatest capability to leverage affordances. This is where you get the most information bang for the buck, if you will. So if you, th you, you think about this, you can array these as well across different, uh, along a continuum. What I'm trying to do right now, and I'm only wishing to share an impression of this rather than a complete research uh, disquisition on it, but what I'm trying to do is use these kinds of basic categories for thinking about how we can leverage different kinds of collective actions according to whether or not they exist solely in, in a digital form or whether there is somehow also the necessity of moving atoms, of actually getting resources, people, to a protest site, or other commodities or objects to a place, what they call supersizing. What I want to try to do in my research as I continue along to think about this with your, with your help and encouragement, I hope, 
is to think about some of the ways in which the, the platforms, the information technologies that one finds in Africa and elsewhere might fit into these two categories. So let me just do a quick run through of some of the more common kinds of platforms that you find being used and deployed in places like Africa and Latin America and elsewhere that are very different. This is where my terminology and what I'm looking at looks generally quite different from what all of you tend to look at. I don't look at Facebook and Twitter so much as I do rapid SMS, frontline SMS, and other kinds of digital aggregating platforms that are appropriate not to a broadband environment, but rather to an environment that's dominated by mobile telephony. Frontline SMS is a, is a text aggregating, either coming in or going out platform that's used to send messages to thousands of people all at the same time, or alternatively, uh, used to aggregate, to bring into and uh, accommodate messages coming into a central platform. There's another similar sort of technology called Rapid SMS that does the same thing. They're just simply two different brands that achieve something really quite similar. What you find here is the ability to create essentially a local area network based on mobile telephony rather than on some sort of web platform. Uh, what one finds is many of these technologies end up being um, sort of nested. They build on one another. So if we were to move on and think about how frontline SMS is often utilized, it's utilized with the Ushahidi platform, which of course emerged out of Africa in the 2000, 2008 uh, post-election violence in Kenya. Uh, Ushahidi is an open source geographical information systems platform that uh, uses geographical spatial references, tags, in order to represent events on a map, on a spatial domain, but it's tagging just tagging of a different sort than what so often is the case with tags on the internet. Ushihidi has been used in a number of places around the world. The platform is a, a way in which one can, among other things, using frontline SMS, display and aggregate reports of need, of crisis, of events that are going on in the community that are crowdsourced using the mobile telephony that's available. They're crowdsourced and brought in and displayed on, on these various platforms. Uh, this is an example of how Ushihidi is being used in the Eastern Congo, where, according to some estimates, though I think they're exaggerated, as many as five million people have died since, since about 1996, where mass rapes and entire villages are at risk. Ushihidi is being used here through mobile telephony, reporting in about events that are going on deep in the bush and displayed on a map. So we have awareness of events that we would not have had in an earlier era. Uh, in the case of the Russia help map deployment that was developed by a former graduate student of mine named Grisha Ismailov, uh, what Grisha and his colleagues were able to do during the 2010 wildfires in Russia was not only document the nature of where events were taking place, but actually utilize by, by the categories, if anyone reads Russian here, help us out, but by utilizing categories over here that actually facilitated collective action. So basically, and if you're not familiar with the Ushihidi platform, each one of these numbers, if this were a live interaction, you could click on it, it would take it into to a higher resolution, and then eventually, across the top, you could click on it and you could actually see the text message. You could see the report, you could see the video, the photograph, etc. So it's a multimedia platform that is geographically, um, uh, spatially represented. So if you were tapped onto the 32, it would take you into a higher resolution. You could see what's going on there. These categories, though, were, were designed to allow for collective action to emerge from the community. So somebody might report that we have, uh, we have need for food and water in this region. Somebody else would be able to report, we have those things. A third person would report, and we have the vehicles to get them to your location. So there was actually a collaboration going on within the community that was not organized in any other sort of hierarchical manner. So these are other examples. But let me actually back up for a second. This is probably the most successful Ushihidi deployment. It was the post-earthquake post deployment in, uh, in Haiti a couple of years ago. So going back to the categories that I introduced Merle and Kimport, you have two basic possibilities. You can use information technology in an area of limited statehood and utilize, leverage the possibilities that are found totally within the informational domain. 
In other instances, you're simply creating greater efficiencies, such as perhaps the Russia help map was an example of. But you still need to get things to places. <coughs> Here's why that's important to me. If you have relaxed the possibility of the existence of the state, and you still, though, have affordances that are created, you have something like governance that's being created, but you still ultimately, is the question, do you still ultimately need something like the state in order to move atoms. And it's a deeply simplified way of presenting it, but I'll, I'll try to make it clear as we go along. In the case of, of the Haiti deployment, people were tweeting in, we need blood of a particular type. That information was being used by American military and the Red Cross and other NGOs in order to get blood to those places that were being reported. So it was crowdsourced in terms of need, and the state came to fill that need. That isn't always possible. So I took this photo, again this is in the Rift Valley, this young man is going around collecting information. He's doing it on a motorcycle. These are Maasai uh, communities, so they're nomadic, they're roaming around constantly, they're hard to find. He would spend days just trying to find these people. I spent some time on the back of his motorcycle trying to help him find those people as well. I suggested a, a supersizing solution for him. They distributed cell phones to the community, and now this young man, rather than riding around on a motorcycle, is instead focusing on specific points of need, and the community are reporting in the various data points using their cell phones rather than trying to physically cover this territory. That's terrific. That's an efficiency, but is the state ultimately still needed in order to get the kinds of resources that are needed for these communities to, to survive and to thrive? So again, I want to continue with the, with the search. In some instances, such as with the Grameen Foundation's community knowledge workers, it's simply a matter of, of sharing information, of totally finding that the nature of the collective action is online using mobile telephony. Here you don't have the Adams problem. You don't need to get resources to, to remote communities. The resource is information, it's knowledge itself. This example of a collective action platform in Africa, Wadi Kivu, raises an interesting problem. It's run by a Columbia University professor named McCartan Humphreys, who works with Joseph Stiglitz in the Earth Institute. And what um, McCurtain was trying to do in the North and South Kivo region of the Congo was creating an information-based alert system. He actually seeded cell phones. He took cell phones into the communities, gave them to phone holders, and, and gave them a, a routine to report back on a regular basis. What are they seeing? And they were in McCurtain at Columbia University in New York was getting stories such as our village was just attacked today. Three people were killed. This community was just it's, it was invaded by the Mai Mai, and, and these number of women were being raped. And here is the basic problem with this technology. You have now a situation where you're in that quadrant. There's no state, but there's an awareness. There's an information technology that allows not only local people to be aware of what's going on, but a researcher sitting at Columbia University in New York. What do you do in that circumstance? You have no mechanism of providing security. You can't do anything. Why not? Because you can't, you don't have the means of actually moving atoms, of getting the resources that are needed, in this instance, security forces, to deal with the crisis that you're learning about in real time through the information network platforms that you have. So it's a kind of collective action. You have awareness of the condition, but what do you do about it? How do you deal with that? See, so this is a kind of collective action condition that is really concerning. For the sake of time, I'm going to jump ahead here just a little bit. I'm running a little out of time. This is another example that's really important of the same sort of global information network capability. And PESA has been revolutionary. Millions of people in Kenya, Tanzania, and Afghanistan are using MPESA. If you think about banking, banking presupposes the existence of the state. Regulation, electricity, security, roads, all of these things, elements of the state, are supporting elements for banking. If those things don't exist, you don't have banking. And so M-Pesa has changed through digital technology, through leveraging technology. M-Pesa has changed the way in which communities, rural communities, manage money. M-Pesa is a value transfer system that's rooted solely in cell phones. Somebody's paid, somebody stores wealth rather than buying another cow, they're storing wealth on their handheld devices. 
and you can see an example of how it's used. You can pay bills, you can buy goods, you can buy airtime, etc., with your M-Pesa accounts. Uh, another interesting aspect of the research that I'm doing is how commonly one now finds innovation hubs in various cities around Africa. Probably the most important one is iHub in Nairobi, which serves as an incubator for technologies that are appropriate to the digital information environment there. So um, what are we looking at here? Uh, what we're looking at here is these collective action characteristics and digital platforms in areas lim of limited statehood tend to be more fluid in the sort of technology, technologically enabled collective action that's found in the global north. And PESA is effective in providing a key public good on its own. It's a theory 2.0. It only exists, it's like the Max Hedrum version, right, of, of technologically enabled collective action. In the case of the Ushahidi deployments, whether it's the Russia help map example or the Haiti deployment or all the, uh, the 15,000 other deployments that one can find with Ushahidi, it's mixed. Sometimes the deployment only has to do with information. In other instances, it's demarcating a need. Who fills the need? Is there a limit here as to what technologically enabled collective action can achieve when there's a necessity of getting security, food, water, medicines, to remote communities, whether they be in North or South Kivu or wherever. I think at that point in time, we run up to a limitation as to what can be achieved in a technologically enabled collective action initiative. You simply need to be able to get security to communities. You have to be able to move uh, atoms, as I say. That is done most often by states or the surrogates of states. If the UN were to leave the Congo now, the entire efforts of almost all of the NGOs in the eastern part of the Congo would simply collapse. One might ask, uh, where is the contention? Where is the power and counterpower in these considerations, in these deliberations? I've given uh, that a lot of thought, especially a, a couple of weeks ago when I was in the Niger Delta region. And when I looked at the extreme poverty that one finds all over such a rich place, and I sort of came to this conclusion. Um, it's often the case that areas of limited statehood are not entirely limited. They're not ent always entirely weak. States in places like Nigeria or Kenya or elsewhere have a capacity to extract value and hold it into the hands of an elite. What the collaborative action that's enabled by the new information technology does is it provides citizens with the capability of challenging some of those conditions. When somebody is languishing in a prison in Nigeria, and if we can follow that person, we can bring a degree of social justice to him or her that otherwise would not exist. So in a sense, the power or the counterpower is to the corruption that is endemic to so many of the states that are found in areas of limited statehood. Areas of limited statehood does not capture as a term the kinds of ways in which we can push back on the corruption, the malfeasance, that is so clearly a part of the lives of people who are living in places like Mathara. Uh, so that's one way in which it really is, in a sense, an ability or a, a claim to push back on that kind of weak state that limits the, uh, the capabilities of the state only to preserve the privilege of the wealthy. There's another concern, though. To the degree to which we can find ways of fulfilling the role of states through collaborative action that's enabled by technology, it introduces a difficult question. Where is accountability? If it's the state, if it's government that is responsible for the provision of public goods, health, security, welfare, clean water, food, we know where to turn, as Amarte Sun has told us. We know where to turn when we want to know who is failing in that job. The degree to which technology is enabling collaborative action on the part of publics where there is no state, it also introduces problems with respect to where is the responsibility? Where is authority in a networked information system? Where, who do we hold responsible for the success or failure of any given deployment if that deployment itself is serving a surrogate role um, for, for governance? Another kind of concern that I have seen has to do with questions of accountability to the degree to which the state itself is beginning to adopt new information technologies as a mechanism for the expansion of its ability to manage an area. In Edo State, 
I was surprised to find that some of the most cutting edge uses of technology is actually being done by the state. In Nigeria, states have a preponderance of the power the individual state governments do. In Edo State, the e-government initiative involves a wide sweeping program of taking biometric information of all of its citizens, putting that information on a chip on a card. That same card is not only a national identity card, it's the card that one uses for all financial transactions. That means the state has biometric information tied to all of your financial records, tied to all of your medical records. So here is an instance of where the accountability of government that's being empowered by information technology leads to some fairly important questions about accountability as well. So these are some of the concerns that one has when one looks at that upper left-hand quadrant. Uh, that is a rushed version of a lot of ideas and thoughts, and I, I hope that I've left you with some questions. Thank you. And I, I apologize. In the middle of my talk, I, I didn't remember your Karine. name. Yes, I know. <laughs> so actually, I'll introduce myself because I didn't have the time to introduce. I'm coming from an information school, so this was yes. fascinating for me. So thank you for your time. She's a The reason why I'm saying that is because I, what captured my mind are two things. First of all, uh, the quadrant, where you talk about high level abundance yeah. of information, low level. And information is such a complex construct, right? Are we talking about uh, creating content, disclosing information, by whom? Is it uh, sometimes abundant information is not relevant, and then it's for me it's like it can, can be considered as low information. Mm -hmm. So the, the term, I think, to try to construct one, one this kind is, of, this, is what, yeah. this is this yeah. as, as low, high information, mm -hmm. I think it needs a little bit of refinement that I would love to, to hear because the, the idea of statehood is, is so important. Yeah. Um, and I'm taking that remark to the to, um, to, to to when you started talking about the super size versus the Kimball's like terms. Yes. Yeah. Why do you need that? You have such a rich yeah. uh, kind of way of explaining what's going on. Why why this timing? Why kind of like bonding yeah. your reality into two kind of let me answer that second question. Uh, I'm utilizing them right now. Actually, they, I won't use those terms as I continue along. It has to do with atoms or bits, from atoms to bits. And, and the reason why that's so important is, is because it allows one to make the distinction between the kinds of collective action that you can pursue in areas of limited statehood, where you can, and this is I'm reprising what I said this a more briefly and so perhaps more clearly. There are instances, such as with MPESA, where you are achieving really remarkable things solely within a digital information environment. And PESA allows for a transference of wealth, a transference of value. That's solely within uh, a, a, a bits, an information environment demarcated only as, as, as ones and zeros. Let me give you an example as to why that might be so important. During a, a time of, of climate change, we're finding that a lot of the pastoralists, the Maasai and, and others in the Rift Valley, they're being decimated because they place, they have a tradition of putting their value in a cow, right? And they buy another cow if they have a little extra money. And, and the cow dies in the middle of, of climate change. Now they're putting their extra money in an MPESA account. And they're getting child care or they're getting uh, um, maternity care for, their, for the females in the village, uh, et cetera. So in that instance, that is the equivalent of, of sort of, it's what I call the, the bits end of the spectrum. On the other end, though, it's not enough. For McCarrington Humphreys to know that somebody was just killed in the village, he needs to be able to, as a first responder, that's what's so fascinating, he's essentially a first responder. He's like a, a paramedic or a cop having to respond to a, a, an emerging emergency, but he's on the other side of the planet. This is where I find the limitations to what I can claim as, a, as somebody trying to work out theory in that upper left-hand quadrant where there's no state. Because the absence of the state, the absence of hierarchy, means that that person is going to die. That woman is going to be raped because it's the state that still has the logistical capability of moving needed resources. So maybe you're not talking really about low and high information, but you're talking about contextualized low this information versus contextualized. Ultimately, the availability of hierarchy versus non-hierarchical institutions. I think is in a sense a context for the impact of, of low collaboration costs or low, um, low information costs. Yeah. yeah, but 
I, I really do want to hear more about that because I think that that you're right. As we continue to refine this, after all, I'm, this, this, this thinking is three weeks old. It's in response to the question he asked. So this is really where I, I will benefit from from what you said. Lance. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, wow. This is a testament to the power of one <laughs> question. Because I heard I heard your talk two weeks ago, and it's been amazingly and wonderfully uh, improved and changed, so way to go. Um, I mean, not that it was bad then. <laughs> it was great then, but it's even better now. Um, but, I, but here's my question about the atoms and bits. I wonder if that's not really where we want to be in thinking about uh, how to deliver you know, police services or health care or, yeah. or emergency relief and so on. I mean, yes, it is involving atoms, of course, but, but governance occurs in a lot of interestingly nuanced ways from states to nothing. Plans to... Yeah. So, so there's NGOs out there, and they need the information, witness, you know, the, the Haiti relief effort. So, yeah. And then there's UN peacekeepers, and there's UN peacekeepers and NGOs working together. And so, so there's a lot of stitched together quasi-governance in the absence of these states which I still think supports your argument that, that the information delivery is crucial yeah. to the response. But I think that you have a, a, a much broader spectrum of response types uh, available to talk about than you s at least conveyed in, in my understanding of what yeah, you're saying. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually not as optimistic about the capacity of NGOs to, to serve as that sort of governance alternative to the state. Uh, and the reason for that is, is that I've spent too much of my time wandering around places in the world where all of the NGOs all congregate to the same NGO community, whether it's Arusha or Goma or, or Kandahar, and vast regions of the country remain untouched. Uh, Clifford Bob in a book called um, Marketing Rebellion talks about this a little bit. And the clustering of NGOs would actually be an interesting, I think you know, there are people who do that uh, research, but NGO clustering around the hot spots. So even within Nairobi, for instance, in Nairobi itself, Kibera is the NGO mecca. Everyone has to have their presence in Kibera. Have you ever seen uh, The Constant Gardener, the movie with Jean Luc Care? That's Kibera. Mithara, right next to, just, just across town, no one's there. No, it's untouched. No NGOs, except for a handful of indigenous ones, ever go. So with, I, I get your point, but with respect to the capacity of NGOs sometimes to serve as alternative systems of governance, is, it, it, it's important. But, but, but in a way, I think you're making my point because, uh, I mean, there's a lot of attacks on NGOs right now. I've, I've got cases that look like NGOs are doing great things and NGOs are doing terrible things. Yeah. They've got accountability problems. They are trying to be accountable. So I think that you could problematize the, the responsiveness of NGOs yeah. along with your information yeah. technology systems. Uh, and, and really look at different cases of success and failure. And I, and I buy what you're saying about where NGOs congregate, and there's dangerous things for NGOs out in other areas, so they don't go there. But, but I also do see examples of sort of successful models of NGO coordinated response that I think you're somehow not, maybe in the countries you're looking at and the problems you're dealing with, you're not seeing it, but I think there's a whole set of other kinds of problems that look like they're uh, amenable to the kinds of communication networks that you're talking about, yeah. where you might find better cases uh, showing what works. Which fits in well with what you've been doing lately with sort of meso movements, with NGOs finding collaboration. Yeah. Yeah, that's essentially. Yes, sir. Yeah, so on the bits atoms dynamic, I mean, I'm completely with you. I, I think it's, it's a conflation and it's confusing and it's not necessarily a useful way to organize the huh. thinking about the really interesting questions that you're actually trying to ask. Um, I think that in terms of the, um, so, so, so the question the question is, um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a place where there's a weak state, how do you do effective service delivery that involves you know, physical goods and services? Right. That's the question. And so then it's how does whatever institution is going to be doing that, whether it's a state institution, a nonprofit organization, a community-based organization, a social movement organization, what are the ways in which that can be an accountable uh, you know, institutional mechanism, accountable to the community that ostensibly serves? Mm. And I think you would then ask that question across all these different types of institutional mm. spaces. It doesn't have to be a state. In, in, in the Juntas de Buen Gobierno in you know, southern Mexico, you have very effectively self-organized security 
by communities in the absence of the state. They don't need NGOs, and they don't, you know, they they've, they have a self-organized mechanism with direct democracy, and it's been very effective for them. Um, actually, they're in and they're in an antagonistic relationship to the state and to many of the NGOs, but they have a, a strong formal accountability mechanism. You know, so that's it's that to me that that's the question. And, and in terms of the bits and atoms thing, it's like, well, if you free yourself from thinking about these two alternatives, then there then there's a really interesting space about so solidarity action at a distance, how people can remotely support really interesting local mechanisms that are doing state service provision. And an example would be, so like, we have to bring up like Coney 2012, right? <laughs> so so what, would have, what would happen if the $30 million raised selling action packs, you know, instead of being used to advocate for US military intervention, was used to directly fund on, on the ground community-based organizations by delivering you know, money to them via an M-PESA-like service, you get a much more interesting dynamic space that has sort of local control than this, you know, we need strong state actors to take care of this situation. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's an interesting observation. I would say one of the things that I'm doing right now is, is actually very specifically going around looking at, at community policing initiatives. Mm -hmm. so I think similar to what you're talking about with respect to right. Mexico. And the challenge there is, is finding ways of leveraging information technology to actually keep some degree of control over the policing mechanisms, the community policing mechanisms themselves, because there's a, there's a habit of mob justice. Uh, you know, the community policing initiatives sound really good, except for, as I, you know, I, I one day last year, I, I saw a, a community policing initiative, and they decided that the best next thing to do is throw the suspect under the bus. Uh, so you, you really are trying to find here a way of gaining a degree of accountability and control and transparency over those community initiatives. Over any initiative. That's right. Any yeah. Whether it's the state, community, the NGO. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I can end up over here. here. Raven and Manuel, yeah. and then Mark. Okay, thank you. So I have a question about you know, what do you think about the relationship between the four congruence that you should hear? So why I ask this question is about the relationship between the weak state and the, the possibility of having a like, governance, network governance, if you say that. Um, so I think you know, maybe to some extent, you know, the, the capacity to have this kind of network governance is because of this net, net, the weak state. Now, the weak state is the weak. As a result, of that you have the proliferation of this commercial uh, mobile company that provides kind of service, mm -hmm. enable them to grow. Instead, compared to a country like a very strong state, they have you know strict regulation mm -hmm. about uh, who can be the mobile companies, so like all state owned, mm -hmm. like in China. And the result, of they actually uh, keep a cap about the how many yeah, yeah how many messages you can send to different people. Right. And the result, of that they all have this kind of e governance. Yeah. So, you know, it's very much, you know, I'd like to hear your comments on this. No, it's just, it's a good observation. I mean, when you look at Africa itself, one of the, the areas that is most, um, that's, that lags the furthest behind is Ethiopia. Uh, yet, uh, ironically, one of the places where one can turn to find the greatest degree of cell phone penetration is Somalia, which those two cases sort of illustrate the point that you were making. To the degree to which you have a powerful state that has interest in maintaining a legacy system, such as a landline system, or, or control over the uh, mobile telephony provider, you end up retarding it. So yeah, there is very clearly the possibility that that vacuum of limited statehood actually introduces uh, an opportunity for entrepreneurs like Mohammed Ibrahim uh, to provide services that otherwise would not have been provided. It's a good observation. Great. Yes, yeah, so my question has to do with the role of, of business and you know, private actors and all this. I, I didn't hear you talk about them much, but my, my sense is that, you know, even in areas of the world where we have consolidated states, mm. you know, you're still seeing so much privatization that the state's capacity to govern has been kind of weakened due to the, you know, private security, privatized everything. Right. And because of that, a lot of movements now have kind of shifted their focus away from the state and have focused more and more on, on corporations, right? Mm. So now they're protesting against Walmart before they even protest against, against the government. Mm -hmm. And I would assume that you know in weak states this is even a bigger problem because there isn't so much of a, you know, a strong government there to, to regulate. You end up having only private actors or businesses, or you know what, what have you, in, in that space to kind of mm -hmm. do what they want. So to, to what extent does that figure into your into your model? Uh, 
if I've understood your question correctly, but let me try to extract the question out of that. Do you see any sort of pushback against corporate presence in places like India or, or, or Africa? I mean, if you can, if you go back to the original formulation, a lot of your late formulated movements was about state-oriented movements, mm -hmm. whereas in today's age, day and age, you, most, a lot of movements are no longer even state-oriented. Mm -hmm. Targeting my point is identities or, or they're targeting um, uh, business first and foremost. Yeah, it's not coming, it's not, if I've, again, if I've understood your, cross, your question correctly, I'm interested in understanding how um, the advance of information technologies in areas of limited statehood facilitate the achievement of public goods of various types, basic public goods. So we're not looking at a protest model necessarily, though I think there's elements of that. We're looking at to what extent do they provide for basic services? But even in a even in a, an area, of the, so even if so, the basic public good is often being provided by a non-state actor, right? So they're not to the degree it's provided at all. So, yeah, to the degree they're not they're provided at all, but they're not competing with the state or going after they're going after. Right. They're competing oftentimes with There's no private state. actors who are providing no. shoddy services. So private security, for example, can be a lot worse than. Regulate, regulate, sure. you know, regulate government security. In some places, that's right. Yeah, it's a close. They're called Gitmen in places like South Africa, uh, because of reasons we won't go into. But yeah, you're right. It was a well, yes. Well, uh, I, I have a, uh, a doubt, a hesitation. Um, I, I very much like your way to present things besides some categories because it, it allows at least myself to think about all these issues, which we often don't. Um, but about your notion of weak state, mm -hmm. ultimately I can see uh, it's in fact you are referring to um, the weak capacity to enforce a statehood, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but, but it seems to me it, then you really are based on the state, the only uh, ability that defines a, a, a consolidated state is the ability to enforce through violence. Legitimate or not, by the way, mm -hmm. because this notion of the legitimate monopoly of violence mm -hmm. means who has the gun, mm -hmm. uh, basically. Mm -hmm. um, so we know that we have uh, a massive crisis of legitimacy in the world, including right. the United States and, and, and Europe. I, I just, for my, my recent book, I collected all the recent information that really between 60%, 55% and 75% of people in the world Mm -hmm. including the United States and Europe, uh, don't, with the exception of Scandinavia, uh, don't think that they are governed legitimately, don't recognize their representation, they don't represent us, etc. So, these states are consolidated no, or that's weak? The, or the, the, how the, we introduce there the crisis of legitimacy yeah. Yeah. Because ultimately, it depends if they still have the police or not. Because if people could vote out the entire political class, like in Argentina yeah. in 2001, they would do it in many countries. Mm -hmm. uh, and what they are doing, they are voting against. Uh, in France, in the recent election, uh, about two thirds of people say they were voting against the other guy, not yeah. for anyone. So how, and, and then the relationship between um, digital technologies, Mm -hmm. and, and other forms of participation becomes critical because if through digital technologies, imagine for one moment, people could control, would have enough access to control the corruption, would have enough capacity to modify the networks of power, intervene there, participatory democracy, and not simply representative democracy. That would actually uh, be, uh, be a, a way to reinforce the legitimacy of the state versus a state that is consolidated in terms of the monopoly of violence, but not con increasingly not consolidated in terms of the legitimacy. How you would think they consolidated the states in this framework? No, I think that we're in agreement. As a matter of fact, I cite in, out of uh, power and counterpower. Um, I, I cite you in, on that regard. My colleagues and I say two thirds of the, of the global population probably lives in an area that is in some measure understood to be an area of limited statehood. And that, that applies every time I ride on the Washington DC metro system, I think, oh, this is a pretty good example of that because it's, <laughs> it's falling apart. 
Uh, so no, I, I don't see any tension between what I'm claiming and what you're, you're saying at all. I think that the growing degree to which states around the globe lack legitimacy, not just in, in Nairobi and Kenya or, or elsewhere, all over the globe. And so if that is true, if, if, if we are forced to relax the assumption of a consolidated state, that suggests actually that my focus on this area of limited statehood in an information-rich environment should be more important, not less important. In other words, I'm moving from... I agree. That's everyone, is, I everyone is doing research here, and I'm saying we should really start paying attention over here because exactly. the state is either missing in places like the Congo or in the metro system in Washington, D.C., and to take a lighthearted example. But, you know, the, the crisis of legitimacy is a driving force that's driving, I think, the research from here to here. We have to stop assuming as Tilly and Taro and others did, that, that somehow, you know, social movements and, 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 and the things that propel participatory democracy somehow exist here. I think it's a great, because the arrow is moving from consolidated state to weaker state, not the other way. Right? Yeah, yeah. I think we can continue this conversation uh, later in the day over dinner. Thank you very much. For Thank you, everyone. Yeah, no, go ahead. Just like uh, combining a little bit the critique of, uh, of Sasha of the, the bits and the atoms, actually, it's the right yeah. distinction of Manuela, the strong and weak state. Also, the strong and weak state for me is very confusing because it's such a relative, try how to get a handle of it, how I could quantify it, right? So, I was rather thinking while you were talking about instead of having the bits and the atoms, um, I was thinking about distinguishing between information gathering activities and analysis and who acts on the information. So you make a distinction between that, who gathers information, acts on information, and then on the strong and weak state about if it's state or if it's non-state actors who yeah. do both of the thing, gather information or act on the information. You get another two by two matrix between state actors and non-state actors and about gathering information, acting on information. And I think what basically what you talked about is that this relationship changes. So some of the information, traditionally information was gathered and analyzed and acted on by the state. Now you're saying that non-state actors on the one hand gather more information, sometimes they don't act on it, they need the state to act on it, sometimes they act on it themselves, and sometimes the state gathers information and non-governmental actors act on it. So um, I think there's another, another way of looking at, at the same thing that you're talking about, but this might make it easier to quantify the shift that you're talking about. Thank you, but we have to defer to the Thank, Thank you very much.